Do you remember the first time you saw the ocean? I'm assuming in Florida here it's safe. If you're at home and haven't seen the ocean, perhaps you've seen a mountain. Um, what was it like the first time you saw the ocean? Did you go, oh, that's really disappointing. <laughs> no, right? You get there and you can see, wow, you can see as far, right? It just goes on and then there's sounds and it smells, right? There's that whole saltwatery smell and the breeze is blowing and it just is this sense of awe, right? Same thing like uh, I did my internship in Littleton, Colorado and when we got there, there's foothills right on the edge of Littleton and I said, wow, look at the mountains and everybody goes, those aren't mountains. Those are foothills. And I'm like, where I came from, those are mountains. But then we went into the mountains and you went, wow. Now, if you see the ocean every single day, is it still the same sense of awe every time? No, right? If you work at Pike's Peak emptying the trash cans and going around there, do you every day look out and go, wow. For some people, maybe, but I talked uh, after the first service, somebody from Duluth said when they drove home, they came over this thing and saw the lake, and the first time they went, wow. And then later would just be like, oh, I'm 10 minutes from home now, right? Like, when you are exposed to these things, it's very easy to lose a sense of awe. Today, we hear from the gospel, or not the gospel, it could have been a gospel, the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts, we hear that the early church were doing certain things together. They were gathering and uh, dedicating themselves to the apostles' teachings. Do we do that? Yeah. They were uh, breaking bread together. Yes, we do that. Praying together. Yep. Uh, having fellowship together. Yep. Um, they were gathering everything they had into one. Maybe not. But then they were selling some of their stuff and otherwise giving generously for the sake of those in need. Do we do that? Yeah. Now, you could argue maybe that we could do a better job at fellowship or we could be more generous, right? But generally, if you went around and visited any church, most churches are studying the teaching of the apostles, gathering around uh, worship and prayer, breaking bread at home, it tells us they did, as well as being at the, you know, gathered together in the temple like most churches are doing all these things. Now, when you get to the end of the passage in Acts, it says, day by day, the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. Does it feel like that's happening in the church? Not as much, right? Like we look around and collectively, at least in our country and in the West, the church seems to be shrinking. And yet, it feels like we're doing all the same things they were doing at the beginning. So, are we doing them wrong? What's that, right? What is it that's happening? And I think there's a little bit of a clue in this text. It says that they were gathered together, and then it says, awe, like everyone was in awe, and then that the apostles were appoint, uh, um, performing signs and wonders, and that's why everyone was in awe. Now, I have to think in those early days post-resurrection, it was pretty easy, if you were a follower of Jesus, to be in awe. But then, after a while, all kind of just like after you've seen the ocean, uh, it starts to fade, right? Uh, we get together and do the liturgy every Sunday. Do you ever walk in and go, wow, the liturgy? <laughs> like, this is why we switch it regular to keep us fresh in it, right? But like this, at some point, the people were showing up to worship because Jesus was standing right there, raised from the dead. And now 2,000 years later, we come to the liturgy. Do we bring a sense of awe? Maybe not. Do we bring a sense of awe to the word when we come to scripture? Maybe sometimes, right? Like my dad used to, uh, if the sunrise was real or the sunset was beautiful, he said he would just stop and say, yay God, right? So sometimes things will pop up on us that maybe inspire us to awe, but it's pretty easy to lose our sense of awe in our places of faith and in the world in general. I've shared this before, but I was on an airplane once, and a guy got on and said, there's no Wi-Fi on this flight? That's ridiculous. And I wanted to say, we're climbing into a metal tube and hurtling through the sky. That's pretty amazing. 
right? Like, we just take for granted that we can fly. Um, I have a torn meniscus in my left knee. And um, if I lived in Jesus' time, I would just have that, right? I would have good days and bad days. And for the rest of my life, people would go, oh, it's raining. How's your knee feel today? But I don't live in Jesus' time, so tomorrow I'm going to go to some surgery center someplace. I don't know how many holes they're going to poke in my knee, but I think they're just going to put a couple of holes in there, a camera, a little thing. They're going to cut that little bit off, and in a few days I'll be back to not having pain and doing normal stuff. That's pretty amazing. But we don't think of that as amazing because it's just everyday stuff now, right? The stuff that they can do with medicine, sometimes you still go, wow, they can do that? But at this point, right, you know people that have had things done, and you just go, yeah, no, that's just it, right? We lose our sense of awe. So if we lose our sense of awe in the world, and we lose our sense of awe, maybe even of God or of our faith, we could do all the things of church and then wonder why it isn't interesting or inspiring to other people. Well, if we don't have a sense of awe about it, why would we? Now, here's the thing. It's the same story. It hasn't changed, right? The Easter story is the same every year. The Christmas story is the same. We tell the same Bible stories. Or So what is it that brings us that all? Last week when I was on vacation, we went to a four-day music festival. Um, not my normal thing because there's crowds of people and lots of noise. But um, it was like folk music -y kind of stuff. And out of the four days, there were most of the bands I had not heard. So when I was hearing new music... It didn't bring me to a place of awe, but more like, well, that's interesting, or that's fun. Uh, like each band that I hadn't heard, right, I'm trying to figure out what their thing is and just trying to listen to it. But then there were some other bands who I knew, which is why we went. There's a band called the Avett Brothers. They are fantastic storytellers and songwriters, and I have been wanting to see them for a long time. And then there's a band called uh, Jason Isbell in the 400 Unit. Also, I've seen him live, but wanted to see him again. So when you come to a concert, you're going to expect them to play all the songs, right? Like, did you know? I've always wondered how a band that's been around for a long time plays the same songs over and over and over. And, like, you know, they get up there and they play their whole thing and then they leave and everybody's like, but you didn't play the one. You got to come back and play the one. That's why we're all here, right? So how do they do that and keep it interesting? Or do they just keep doing it? So the Avett brothers, um, I've, they didn't play a song I hadn't heard before. They have one song that starts off, he goes, I've got something to say, it's all vanity, all vanity. In that part of the song, there's not a lot of instruments happening. Well, then the next part of the song, which I've never seen them live, I didn't know this was going to happen, the other brother sings the next part, because they sound a lot alike, but he's at the piano, and then all of a sudden the guitar comes in, he starts hammering on the piano. I'm like, hold on, this is a conversation. I did not know that, right? And maybe it's not always when you hear it on the album, but when you're seeing it live, all of a sudden the story comes together in a different way. And I turned to my friend, and I said, this is awesome, right? Because it was, even though I knew all the words, it was something new and different. Now, um, the other thing that apparently happens at music things like this is that everybody has to show you what they can do on the guitar. Um, I don't need you to prove it. I believe you. Like, just five minutes of... Blah, 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 that's not my thing. But Jason Isbell has a song, uh, and the, the refrain of it is, Am I the last of my kind? Right? And it's sort of this, almost a lament that things aren't the way they were. And uh, his guitarist started doing the guitar thing, but it had a little bit more melody to it, so I was like, okay. But then he walked over and stood in front of him with his acoustic guitar, and they started to go back and forth. So the electric guitar is going, no, 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 and then he plucks something out on his acoustic guitar, and they're going back and forth. And it is very clear that whatever they're doing is new, right? So same old song, but new. But also, it's about somebody being the last of their kind, and you got this old acoustic guitar with this modern electric guitar, right? So it's helping tell the story. So I turned to my friend and said, awesome. Then, when the Avett brothers, the other one that hit me, they have a song that starts off, um, If I Get Murdered in the City. 
Um, it's not as bleak as it sounds. Um, but it comes around to a part where he says, if I get murdered in the city, go read the letter in my desk. Don't worry about all my belongings, but just pay attention to the list. Let, make sure my sister knows her lover. I love her. Make sure my mother knows it too. So they get to that part of the song, and he says, make sure my girls know I love them, and make sure my boys know it too. And I was like, oh, when he wrote that song, he didn't have any kids, but now he does. So the same song, but different. And the other thing was, the whole time he sang that song, his inflection of his voice, and I could sing the whole song to you, the way it is like on the album, right? But in the, when he sang it live, where normally his voice would go up, his voice went down. And where it went down, it would go up, or he would hold the note a little bit longer. So it's the same exact song, kind of, with some different words, because he's in a different place. But then he sang it way different, and it was all together new. And I turned to my friend and said, awesome, right? So I was at this thing where I knew exactly what was going to happen, but then it was awe-inspiring because it was altogether different. And that's what they brought to it. So when I think about the life of the church, this is where I get stuck in my little Lutheran conundrum of we can't bring ourselves to know and love Jesus. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't manufacture grace. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And then I have to ask, can we give ourselves awe? Probably not. But can we, knowing that we have this gift of grace in life, go out into the world with a sense of curiosity and wonder that might help us to see things and say, awesome, right? Even though it's the same stuff we see each and every day. And then I start to wonder what the life of the church looks like if we live with a sense of awe so that in our gathering and in our breaking of bread and in our praying and in our worship and all the rest of that, that awe is something we carry with us and that then might inspire others to be connected to this very old story that we can tell in very new ways uh, all as we go along. Now, the other part of this text that um, we can get a little bit hung up on is that um, the apostles were performing signs and wonders. Were any of you planning on signs and wonders later today? You can read the book of Acts, right? They do healings, they cast out demons. But the story gives us another little hint, and it says everyone had goodwill for them. I'm thinking signs and wonders might not be as complicated as we think. If we have a community that we cultivate with a sense of awe, that can have hard conversations about things that our culture can't, right? If we can have people from both sides of the debate sit down and have a cordial conversation and come to a space of mutual understanding. Is that what happens around us? No. Could that be a sign that something new and different is unfolding? Yes. Would people wonder at that? I hope so. If we can build a community where people can just come and be who they are in a world that is constantly tearing people down, is that a sign and a wonder? Yes. If we can build a, a community that says, you know what, we don't think violence is the answer to our problems. We think Jesus' invitation to peace is, and so we're not going to participate in those same things. Is that a sign and a wonder? If we can cultivate forgiveness in a world that is unforgiving, is that a sign and a wonder? Of course. Can we do any of that without awe? Not so much. So, And I'm not sure we can manufacture awe, but I do think we can point it out to one another and say, that's awesome, and help grow that amongst ourselves. And so today, my prayer for us is that like the early church, we can be in awe, that the Holy Spirit will inspire us to be in awe, drag us kicking and screaming to awe, so that that awe can fill us up with grace and then inspire the world around us to hear the same old, old story, but in new ways that connect to their days, connect to their life, connect to their faith, so that they can experience that awe as well. Amen.